Welcome to the Tense Female Classroom, a community where occupational therapists and teachers can collaborate to share information on sensory motor activities, ideas and strategies to increase our awareness and knowledge and to ultimately further assist students in our classroom. I am absolutely thrilled today to be speaking with Jane Harwood, um, who is the author of the Sensory Circuits book, which many of you may know. My name's Rachel Gaunt. I'm an occupational therapist and founder of the Sensory Motor Classroom. Jane, so great to have you here. I am so thrilled that we were able to connect and touch base. Um, I first met you many, many moons ago when I sought you out to be my mentor, I believe 12 years ago now. Um, and it's just, time seems to have just flown in an instant. Um, it's wonderful to connect with you again. And I'd love if you would just share a little bit about kind of who you are and where you're from, what you're doing now. It's lovely to see you. And it was nice to connect with you, Rachel. And um, well, what I'm doing now is now I am a retired lady. I am uh, being a grandma now, which is my most important job. Absolutely. Four to be a grandma to one, another one at Christmas. So oh that's that bit. Um, I Before pre-COVID, I was also volunteering, doing bits in schools, really supposedly going into helping classrooms, but ending up doing a bit more special needs because there isn't anything. Um, but uh, prior to that, I mean, my OT background has been slightly eclectic, really. Um, in my day, when you qualified, you then had to do a rotation and you did lots in adults and psychiatry and learning difficulties. And I did elderly mentally ill and a whole range of burns, plastics, orthopedics, etc. Oh. And then I didn't really go into paediatrics until my children were small. And it was one of those serendipity. I needed a term time only contract. And the only place that would offer it was community paediatrics. So ended up there. Okay. Um, I sort of, so I think sort of like lots of people, we sort of all ended up where we love, but mm -hmm. not necessarily sort of in a direct route. Yeah. Yeah. And then what led you to, um, from being in paediatrics, to kind of go into more the sensory um, as into integration route and, and to um, explore that further? Well, I was working in the NHS mm -hmm. and um, I, I had two jobs which basically I had two part-time jobs within the NHS that gave me a full-time post so I had half-time 18 hours in community work which was schools and then I had 18 hours in um, child psychiatry so I had a really interesting time because I had these sort of two heads and two completely different roles at various points. But it became quite clear to me that I was often seeing extremes, but of the same child. Okay. So sometimes they appeared in child psychiatry. Okay. And sometimes they were just a difficulty in school. So I began sort of um, going on various courses, as you do, mm -hmm. trying to see, can I discover something that would be helpful? And I came across uh, introductory day to sensory integration and didn't really know anything more than uh -huh. that. Managed to get funding, rocked up, and within about two hours thought, Oh my goodness, that's that kid. Oh my goodness, that's that kid. Oh my goodness, that applies to that kid. Mm -hmm. And started thinking, do you know, this is what it's all about. This is how the brain processes. This is the important stuff. And, you know, all those endless handwriting practices that we've been doing mm -hmm. and not getting anywhere, all those, you know, we will teach you to tie your shoelaces and still not getting anywhere because we hadn't done the first bit. So 
I fell into sensory integration and then from there begged, borrowed, did anything to try and get funding to get more courses okay. to try and, you know, learn more really. Um, but I also at the same time looked at other things. So um, I got involved with a lady called Phoebe Caldwell who oh. does something called intensive interaction. Yes. Um, so looked at that because that had elements that were interesting. Um, I got involved with people um, who were looking at attachment disorders, mm -hmm. uh, people who were looking at the effects of music, all those sorts of things. Yes. But all of them came into play, but the sensory processing and the work of Jean Ayres Mm -hmm. was mind-blowing for me yeah. and I think not everybody realizes that I think now that occupational therapy and sensory um, integration particularly air sensory integration is kind of almost anonymous in pediatrics but back yeah. um, many years ago it was not the case hey it was still an emerging yeah. role it was still yeah. an emerging theory yeah um, and it's really exploded yeah. over the last few years um, as our yes. knowledge has increased and there's, there's been more research. I mean, when I was in, um, first started in paediatrics, you know, you'd get a referral for a, um, a pencil grip mm -hmm. or, you know, poor handwriting. So you'd trot along to school and you'd look at different pencil grips and you'd put the child on a handwriting programme and you'd come back in maybe a term and they were no further forward because until I had, you know, the knowledge of sensory integration, I had no understanding that A, they didn't know where their hand was or what it mm -hmm. felt like or mm -hmm. couldn't process the sensation of how the pencil felt on the page or they needed to do something before they could sit still and use their eyes, all those sorts of things. So, you know, I mean, it's always, hindsight's always a wonderful thing, but sure. I often think mm -hmm. about those children that I completely and utterly failed. Um, you know, because basically in those days, I very much gave them a task they were bad at and I just gave them more things that they could fail at. Mm. But in more recent, well, in the latter part of your career, obviously you became very um, well known in terms of the sensory integration piece um, and particularly being able to share sensory motor strategies um, for yeah. schools. Can yes. you tell us a little bit more about kind of the book, Sensory Circuits, kind of what, kind of where that kind of concept came from and kind of just a little synopsis of Sensory Circuits? Sure. Well, I mean, it, it, it started out of desperation. I'm, you know, I'm not embarrassed to say I was a jobbing OT with too many kids on my case, too many cases, um, mm -hmm. and the school's were crying out for something. And really, the first thing that happened, it would happen by accident. So I had one particular school in a place called Peterborough that I was involved in. Mm -hmm. And I had probably about 12 children I was seeing in this one junior school mm -hmm. at that time. And I had a very good relationship with the head teacher. And I said, well, you know, it's difficult to come in too often because I just wasn't permitted it just wasn't possible but we could do something maybe if we could have use of the hall or use of a, a room or whatever and could I have a teaching assistant and I'll set something up for all the children and we'll try and do it every day on a regular basis and I just put together <laughs> A whole group of exercises because I had some children with coordination problems, some children with some anger problems. I had some kids with um, difficulty with handwriting. Other kids couldn't sit still. And I thought, well, I think I can put together a whole range of things that they can do every single day mm -hmm. that are fun, that can be done as a group and only run by one teaching assistant. And we basically started that and by half term I had feedback from the teachers and the head teacher saying I want more 
I want more of this. Wow. This child is now sitting still. This child's handwriting has improved. We've not had any anger problems with this kid. And I began to think, well, okay, so what have I done? <laughs> or what yeah. have, what's that teaching assistant done mm-hmm. that's had this impact? And of course, the main thing is that it was regular. It was happening every day and these kids were getting consistent input. Mm. We learned very quickly that if we did certain exercises at the end, we sent them all out high as kites. And if we put certain exercises in at the beginning, then we calmed them down. So we learned by our mistakes. And then over time, I began to come up with this formula which became the sensory circuit formula, which is alerting, organizing, calming, a way of understanding how to use activities to integrate sensation, Mm -hmm. improve motor skills, improve self-esteem and self-worth, help these kids feel they've achieved something and help these kids move on. So that's how it all started. I then started doing circuits in other schools in nurseries in Peterborough, in various other places. And then I got a contact by the publishers who said, we'd like a book. And I went, no, (laughs) (laughs) I don't write books. I play with children. That's what I do. Uh I don't write books, but they persuaded me. And I do feel very strongly, and I still feel that there was one of me and there's never going to be enough OTs and never going to be enough teachers and never going to be enough people to work with all the children. So what we need to do is educate, educate and share. And so I felt strongly, OK, if we're going, if I'm going to write a book, it needs to be a book aimed at teachers, yeah. parents, people in institutions that they can read, understand quickly and do Mm -hmm. and I think what's really key about sensory circuits and why I really um, enjoy them is that inclusivity piece of it that they can be used for the whole of the school or certainly more than just the child that's having some challenges it's that inclusivity they're fun they are engaging but they're not equally like you you have the issue come and do these they are activities that all children want to do and they can do together I mean I always used to say to all the schools you know you've got a good sensory circuit running when the kids who aren't in the circuit are looking through the window going, I want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Let me in. Not, oh, it's the special class, you yeah. know, that's for the special people. Everybody wanted to go. And you knew then you'd got enough high profile. It was correct. It was the right buzz in the school. And that was new or on the winner then. It was brilliant. Nice. Nice. And, where have you found that the sensory circuit concept has taken you? Obviously, you started it in Peterborough, but it's grown yeah. from Peterborough. <laughs> I mean, I left the NHS and went into private practice mm-hmm. because I wanted to do more lecturing, sharing, developing the sensory circuit model and sharing it out there. So, I mean, in private practice, I travelled all over the United Kingdom, basically, everywhere and anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've, you know, talked to people in uh, special schools, in very specialist centres, so places for purely autistic individuals or people with profound physical difficulties. That was a real challenge. So, you know, a, a, a school would get in contact and say, we want you to come and talk to us and see our kids All of them are in wheelchairs. All of them have profound difficulties, can't move, need a hoist, can't communicate. How are we going to do this? Um, And that was a wonderful challenge, but it is amazing what you can create with a hoist, with a load of mats. You know, we found ways of giving, alerting, organizing and calming activities. 
um, and that was fascinating. And yeah. um, I've also uh, sort of um, given lots of sort of just information to parents as well who want to own their own sensory circuits at home. Okay. They have sure. a child who's got a particular need and we've worked out ways of doing things in your front room. Mm -hmm. So, you know, before bed, some kids have had a particular sensory circuit because that's helped them go to sleep. Mm -hmm. Other kids have had a particular sensory circuit because during the school holidays, life is awful without it. Yeah. So, I mean, I've also <laughs> started to dip in but I think there's a lot more work to be done with babies and toddlers mm -hmm. um, and did a little bit of time with um, some nursery groups and some just mum and toddler groups as well, looking at different things you could do with, you know, helping to regulate your toddler, which is, as those of you who own them know, it is not easy. <laughs> and, and I've, you know, there's a lot more work to be done there. So um, I've been, you know, very lucky. I've worked with individuals, I've worked with groups, I've worked with schools and lots of professionals as well. And also um, try to spend time working alongside speech and language therapists, paediatric physiotherapists, um, other professions who maybe are looking at a child with a different angle mm -hmm. so we can all work together. And I really feel that's key and certainly something that resonates in the, the, I guess, the foundations of the sensory motor classroom is all about collaboration. And we all have our specific knowledge set, and but there's such big overlaps between yeah. them all. And if we can collaborate and share yeah. that knowledge, our, our own knowledge is only yes. greater and can only better our understanding for the students we work with. Yes, absolutely. And I think, you know, Particularly, um, I love working with teachers, absolutely love it. I've loved it from day one. Um, I've got two children who are now teachers. So okay. you know, I've, I've sort of worked with them and worked with the grassroots and all the rest of it and keep saying, put sensory in your schools, come on. Um, but, you know, teachers are wonderful at saying, give me some information, teach me. You know, I've got this child, I don't get them. There's something going on here. Um, I've never met a teacher yet who hasn't been absolutely right that there's something about that kid. They yeah. might not know what it is, yeah. but they're absolutely right every time. There's something about this one. We're not getting anywhere. It's not clicking. Something's odd. Something's different. Um, and I mean, you know, I've learned very much through working with teachers and watching my own kids become teachers, how very little child development they get. Okay. Um, you know, and then you're thrown into school, given a curriculum or whatever it is you have to teach. Um, and you've got 31 beings in front of you, all who are at different developmental levels. Yeah, yeah. They are amazing. Absolutely, absolutely. And then when you've gone into the schools to, to kind of talk about sensory circuits with teachers, how um, have you been able to kind of present the different aspects? So I guess let's take alerting first of all. How have you been able to kind of share, um, okay, this is a sensory circuit. These are the alerting concepts. Right. What I tended to do from my point of view is when I was working, I would go and I would start, first of all, giving a twilight session with a, a group of teachers okay. to, to begin to help them understand why we're doing this. What, what, is, what is the theory behind this? What do we know about the brain? What do we know? Because if you can begin to talk about neurology, you take away the emotion, mm -hmm. you know, it's, there are all times with our own children and those we work with that sometimes it feels like a child is winding you up or doing something on purpose or whatever. But sometimes they're just being what their brain is telling them to be. 
mm. or trying to gain a sensation their brain is wanting. So I can then begin to talk about what alerting is. Um, and I often used to um, start with being very practical. So we'd, we'd look at one child in the school and we'd put together a program of activities for that child. So, you know, I can think of one particular little girl who came in fact, she was not the child that we were working on, but her, um, her teaching assistant had to suddenly help somebody, another child because of illness. Okay. So two children arrived into a room which was attached to the school where I was working with these kids. And um, we did a program of alerting activities. And one of the alerting activities was we had a trampet mm -hmm. and they jumped up and down on this trampet. And this little girl had little to no expressive language. Um, very quiet, no problem in the classroom at all. You know, one of those joyous ones, but produced nothing. So she jumped up and down on this trampet, went back into school, literally walked along the corridor, went back into school and said, hello to a teacher, what are we doing now? And that was more than she'd ever said in half a term. Wow. And the the teacher said, what the hell went on there? And the teaching assistant said, we've just done an alerting activity mm -hmm. and this is what's happened. So it, it's sometimes good to work small mm -hmm. and start with one child or, and see an impact. And then you can begin to talk about other alerting activities. Sure. Um, and then hopefully gain the enthusiasm of a school to set up a sensory circuit. Yeah, and that's a really good point. Um, rather than feeling, oh my goodness, I have to set up this perfect sensory circuit. It's about having an alerting activity or an yeah. organizing activity, a calming yeah. activity, maybe a three yeah. step activities that you can yeah. do yeah. on a regular yeah. basis and show yes. effects. Yes, keep it small to start with. You need success. You need success in a school to breed success because schools are places where everybody is asking things of them the whole time. Mm -hmm. You know, we want all we want a social worker wants a form filling in, someone else wants something else, you've got to fill in. You know, the teachers are being pressurized the whole time. So if you are saying, right, I think this can help, you have to show it can help and you have mm -hmm. to have success. So minimal equipment, minimal time, minimal staff input. Um, and I would nine times out of 10 find that teacher or that teaching assistant who was enthusiastic. Okay. <laughs> and we would work, we would pick a child, you know, one of the children on somebody's caseload or something that was causing particular, and we'd just say, right, let's try this activities can you do them every day, you know, in a corner, you know, and um, we started without any equipment at all. So our, my first little circuit, I can think for one child, the alerting was literally jumping up and down, doing star jumps, okay. and then jumping around in a circle. Um, and then our organizing activity was literally the old patting head and rubbing your tummy. Uh-huh, yeah. And we finished with, and our calming activity at the end was doing a chair push-up, sit-up. So hands on the chair, trying to push your bottom off, and then they went back into class. And, you know, and we did that every day before they started school. Now, before we did this programme, that individual came into school and created havoc when they're trying to do register and just didn't settle. Within a week of doing it, the teacher was beginning to notice they were coming in and they were just sitting and, mm -hmm. and listening. Mm -hmm. And by half term, you couldn't spot them. Wow. So, and I can imagine also if you're in a classroom and you're a teacher and you feel like you would like to do this with the whole class 
And you yeah. could equally do a very simple circuit, something similar yeah. with that alerting, that organizing and that yeah. calming activity yes. for the whole class to enable them all to be at their most yeah. optimum. Yeah. And I mean, if you, if you, as long as in your head, you remember that alert, you never ever change the order of the formula. Okay. Yeah. I have, I have had moments when people have changed it and gone oh I've decided to do the calming first no <laughs> right you start with alerting and any activity that involves that basically getting that shaking of the head where your vestibular system is activated okay mm -hmm. or looking down looking up anything like that is yeah. alerting and those so, rotary activities as well where we can really kind of get that vestibular real high impact piece absolutely i mean once you've got the hall and got space i mean i can remember we had this wonderful group of boys all who supposedly had behavioral problems and one of the things they loved to do in the morning was we had a horse you know a, um, a p type horse that they, okay, like, they climbed cool, on Daisy? and then they yeah okay and they yeah. climbed on on this thing and they jumped off into a crash mat and were allowed to crash and they used to jump crash jump crash jump crash i mean till they were out of breath and then we moved on to another activity but it was wonderful to see these kids because they it was like a drug they were getting what their brains needed mm -hmm. and then once they got it, they were delightful. <laughs> they were just lovely. But without it, they were yeah. not so delightful. Yeah. <laughs> and we did, with that group, have to repeat the circuit. Okay, so we used to do it first thing in the morning and we used to do it at lunchtime and we used to do it towards the end of the day so they were in a good place for their parents when their parents came to pick them up okay okay only it would took 10 minutes we did a 10 minute circuit no longer okay so you don't need to make it long but mm -hmm. we had access to a hall and we had access to equipment there which worked sure it's not always possible but as you say you can do it with a whole class um i mean there is <laughs> I can remember um, when I worked with my son in one of his schools that he's taught in, um, and I went in working as a teaching assistant once I'd retired, and uh, he had a young man who I should think at some point will probably get a diagnosis of ADHD, I would think. And this child was incapable of sitting still or paying attention or whatever, and was disruptive. Okay. And one of the activities, this was nothing to do with my prompting. I will praise my son for this. Uh -huh. He said, right, OK, Fred, you have got to run. He opened his classroom door, which was onto the playground, which was enclosed. You have got to run all the way around the playground before I finish the register. Oh, wow. Talk and, about alerting. And, and get to your name. <laughs> Yeah, and get to your name. And they used to do the register really, really quickly. And of course, all the kids would go, come on, come on. Yeah, and this kid used to go around and he'd be told you've got to go around three times or five times or whatever. It was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. He came back in and then over time, he had to do it before his name. And he then learnt where his name was in the register. Okay. Um, English was a second language with this kid. Okay. So there was other issues there as well. It was just brilliant. But a quick, easy activity. The kid enjoyed it. The rest of the class loved it. Because he's coming, he's coming, sir. He's coming. Um, and he came back in. And he was ready. He was ready nice. for something else. Yeah. Wow. The simple stuff sometimes. And as much as we think of alerting, organising and calming, often when we do an activity, and um, particularly something like running, because of all that joint compression that they're getting, as well as the vestibular, yeah. there's that yeah. organising component too. Um, exactly. Exactly. It? Most act most activities that we do have a multi-sensory component. Sure. And, and I guess I was just about to, to ask, kind of what are some of your, when you go on to organise, even though it's perhaps not... We, we keep them separate, it, but they, to help align the order, but they, I guess, have 
are working on different areas, but what would be some of your kind of go-to organizing activities that you found kids really have it loved and engaged with? Maybe those that are good to be used without equipment and those that are good to use with equipment. Right. I mean, without equipment, I always say to people, it, it's it, the organizing category is is when you're asking your brain to do more than one thing, which is basically what we ask children to do at school. We ask mm -hmm. them to sit still, listen, and normally hold a pencil at the same time. Yeah. So the organizing, you know, is you can be stood on one leg and clap happy birthday. That's an organizing activity. Mm -hmm. um, you can, I'm looking down here, I'll get the glasses on because I wrote down some more because I knew I'd forget. Um, Patter cake. I've done patter cake with children opposite each other. All those sorts of patter cake games mm -hmm. are lovely. Yeah. And if you've got some equipment, one of the lovely ones are beanbag activities. So put a beanbag on your head, then you've got to drop your head to catch your beanbag. Now that seems a really easy activity. It's not. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really not. And then if you've got equipment obstacle courses any sort of obstacle course in under through on round mm. balance um you know a lot of children that we work with now and i mean you know it's not that long ago that i retired but many children that i was seeing then some of it was lack of experience rather than developmental difficulties. They hadn't been permitted to climb a tree, to mm -hmm. get to the top of the playground, to get to the top of that climbing frame and discover, uh-oh, I'm a bit high now. Yeah. I don't know how to get down. How am I going to do this? Where am I going to put my leg? How am I going to do this? You know, get that depth perception and work out where your body goes. So obstacle courses are a wonderful thing. And of course, from a home point of view, if you're running a home sensory circuit, you can crawl over your sofa, under a chair, um, you can balance on one leg, you can get some, you know, um, sturdy plant pots and walk from one to another. You can do a whole number of things to do with obstacle courses. Yeah, and there's so many... Yeah, it's just that I guess the opportunities are endless when we think of obstacle courses and the visual of using equipment can also be yeah. really helpful for children too to be able to yeah. kind of understand, oh, okay, so this is under, oh, this is over. And particularly those really? with less um, kind of receptive language. Yeah, yeah. And even a simple thing, I don't know if you can remember doing this as a child where um, you tied a rope a skipping rope to something <laughs> and then the other person had the skipping rope and you started with it very low and you jumped over it and then it was held a bit higher and you had to jump over it and a bit higher and a bit higher so you had to work out how to get over and then you can equally do it getting under with mm -hmm. the rope going lower mm -hmm. simple things like that take a lot of brain organizing and they're super fun to do. So then when we think of alerting, we're thinking of energizing, we're thinking of kind of getting that, that inner ear, that vestibular system yeah. um, stimulated, organizing, we're really thinking about doing simultaneous tasks, being able to kind of coordinate our body, being able yeah. to kind of have a sense of where our body is in space in relation to other, other aspects and complete things like obstacle courses. And then we have calming. What are some of the activities that um, you found have been effective in the classrooms or in schools for calming? Um, I mean, calming is, I think, one of the most important things because if you can get this right, you can also teach children something they can do when they're not feeling too good or they're feeling worried about something. So when you've got space and maybe you've got the school hall or wherever or outside to do your sensory circuit, um, you know, there is nothing better than trying to do a plank on a mat 
or trying to do a wall push up or tug of war, tug of war with two people pulling just on a tea towel or a piece of rope. Mm. It's a fantastic thing. Um, you don't have to, you know, be sat there doing a yoga exercise to do calming. Sure. Um, I used to, um, when we didn't have any equipment, I, it's an old ski exercise where basically you sit with your back against a wall and your hips and knees at 90 degrees and you've got to stay there for as long as you can till your quads and your bottom are going, no, no. But, <laughs> you know, that's a wonderful calming one. I mean, I don't know, you know, COVID that's hit us all is yeah. difficult at the moment because one of the wonderful things we used to do were ball squashes mm -hmm. where the child would lie on their tummy and you'd use a, a, a fit ball and basically squash and apply pressure, which gives you a lovely, lovely calming sensation. Um, but anything that involves, you know, push, pull, carry, lift, tug, basically. Mm -hmm. That was my mantra, anything that we could do. So again, in old schools, we had bars and we used to, children used to hang <laughs> from the bars. Okay. <laughs> and those used to be wonderful. So we did it outside and um, when the summer and we used bike, the bike racks to hang from <laughs> um, where people were meant to put their bikes and we moved all their bikes and we hung from the bike racks and that worked really, really well. Um, oh, that sounds cool and very much <laughs> opposite from sitting yoga style meditation versus calming yeah. yeah I mean that works for some children and we mm -hmm. used to I mean I used to do those sorts of you know things for some children but for, for others you know you say squeeze this muscle and breathe and relax and well they can't because they don't know which muscle to squeeze and also they don't know what relax feels like because they've never got there yet. Yeah. So really, it's when we're thinking about calming, again, we're coming back to those proprioceptive activities to, to help activate kind of that parasympathetic nervous system to calm and chill the body. And it could be an act, active as well as more yeah. of a, a gentler yeah. part. Yes. Depends on your children. Depends on your children. However... The thing that I learned about circuits is if you're short of time, yeah. you can do alerting activities and you can miss out organizing, okay. but never, ever, ever miss out calming. <laughs> so you okay. could go from alerting to calming and, you know, and do a very short circuit that would have some impact but don't do alerting organizing and then go bye kids that mm. will not work and i think we often see that very concept when children come in from the playground so they've kind of been very much alerted running around outside yeah. they may have done some yeah. organizing activities in their play may or may not but that calming aspect is often missing and they come in kind of yeah. a little bit wildly yeah if it's a windy day, they come in as high as kites. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, it's a funny old world, isn't it? So we as adults have done our development and we've done our neurological development and we're ready and we're stood there in a classroom or whatever we're doing with that child, but we're facing beings who are still developing. And yet our expectation is, well, you should be available and ready for what I want you to do. Yeah. I mean, particularly the first seven years of a child's life, their brain is all about sensation. You know, they are just, give me sensation. I need it big time. Um, and they get to school and we are all about sit still, yeah. don't make a noise, yeah. <laughs> pay attention, now learn. And they're mm. not ready. We need mm. to understand neurology and child development, which is, doing something that helps a child be available for what we want them to yeah. do. We actually had a question that's been typed into the chat. Um, I want to share it because I feel like it, it links in with it, particularly with looking at development. Um, so it was, do you notice an increase in developmental delays or possible just lack of physical, sensory and fine motor exposure with the use of more and more technology? 
for <laughs> most people's lifestyles. Um, we are breeding sedentary children. Mm -hmm. um, and we're breeding kids that are very good at looking at screens and they've got amazing thumb skills <laughs> and you know they can they can tap things and um, it's not so much there's an increase in dele developmental delay that's a whole different diagnosis but what we're getting is lack of experience uh -huh. and brains develop synapses and develop neurons through endless experiences and also experiences that are a just right challenge that cause you a challenge so it's back to that climbing frame you've got to the top oh my goodness I've got to work out how to get down I'm a bit scared I've, I've gone a bit higher than I wanted to but I will work it out and by working that out yes. you are developing those neural networks that mm -hmm. are so important with brain development if you have sat and you've spent all your time just doing one sensation which yes. is sitting on a screen mm -hmm. and then you rock up to school having been brought there in a car or transport apart from anything else you get very very unfit <laughs> Um, and your fitness levels go down. And it always amazed me when we started getting children to jump on trampettes or jump up and down, how out of breath they became. Yeah. They were so unfit. Um, so, I, yeah, I am concerned. And I think that's, you know, a, a very pertinent question. So I've always had an interest in fitness myself. And I feel very strongly that what sensory circuits also can provide is a way of introducing children to physical activity that can be fun mm -hmm. that hopefully they will then enjoy and want to do more of yeah and and the question kind of ends as well is it kind of back to simple tasks so it's really that yeah. back to using their bodies and um, that really yeah. back to the basics of just learning how yeah. to use your body and be in charge of your body and know where it is in space and how to yeah. engage with other yeah. objects yeah. and we also remember that with a developing brain i was just going to say you need to do activities with frequency with intensity with duration so you know most of us can remember rolling down a hill till you felt sick <laughs> and then you got up and you did it again yeah. Or you were on a swing and you were trying to get it as high as you could or going round and round with it and then twiddling it. Or you took these things to the extreme yeah. and you did that because you're hot wired to do that. Yeah. And of course, as adults, we're hot wired to say, don't do that. That's dangerous. Get down. <laughs> Yeah, and we have a, another question actually that's just come in as well. Um, it's just talking about um, not necessarily the, the safety piece of what we do as adults, but what are some of your um, favorite kind of calming activities that I know we touched on some already that right. some, as an adult we can help children um, and students kind of engage with um, it was kind of favorite slash most effective. Okay, and um, if you've got a number of children you're working with, then a tug of war activity, which I think I talked about before, yeah. can be great fun. Particularly if you've got active kids that you know are full on, they love that sort of thing. And um, not just younger children; I've used it with quite old ones as well. We've taken a blanket and they've rolled up in the blanket, so they are tightly um, rolled up. And then basically being, you know, we've said you are the sausage in a hot dog and we're going to squash the tomato ketchup out. And then we've, you know, put pressure on things like that. Um, I like to give children activities that they can learn to do and then apply in other settings, i.e. their bedroom or somewhere else. Okay. So seated push-ups, wall push-ups. Um, you know, those kids that can, handstands against a wall, are brilliant. I mean, there's a whole load of us who spent years 
stood upside down with a handstand against the wall in a playground for a lot of time. Yeah. Um, and you wonder, you know, why did we do that? Because it made us feel good. Yeah. Um, all those sorts of activities. I mean, I, I can remember um, uh, a year six teacher told me that um, it was SATS time, our dreaded assessment times in British schools, and he had a very anxious little girl in his class. And he'd been leading up to this, he'd been running a sensory circuit in the class for the kids. They'd done it outside every morning to try and calm them down before they had to do their tests. And this little girl said, um, uh, she came in from the weekend and she said, oh, sir, you know, it's been really helpful what you taught us because I went home on Friday night and my dad said, oh, we've got to go out again to see so-and-so. And she said, I really didn't want to do that. So she said, I went up into my bedroom. I commando crawled around the floor. I jumped up and down and then I did wall push-ups. I then felt better and I was ready to go. Oh my goodness. Now, isn't that wonderful yeah. that she just thought, yeah, I need to do that. And that's when you know it's been so, effective, hey, when it goes from school you, to home or vice versa. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And the calming ones that I like to do as well when we are permitted to touch children are to do with compressions on their shoulders or squeezing their hands or getting some deep pressure input and yeah. um, that is wonderful absolutely wonderful I would say that sometimes if you're going to do that get somebody to do it to you first before you do it to someone else you know what it feels like yeah and also, if you're going to do it, do it with confidence. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good advice. Instead of going no, in the... mm -hmm, and not being sure and kind of maybe like doing it awkwardly or... Yeah. Like, I, oh, I my goodness. know, like yeah. this kind of... I touch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you're going to do it, do it. Um. You know, it, it's amazing the amount of kids that um, really like deep pressure. And when they like deep pressure, they want pressure. Okay, yeah. Well, Jane, I feel like we've covered so many different areas. Um, I guess just in closing, what, because we have touched base on so many different strategies and different areas, but for particularly for teachers listening or for occupational therapists that are wanting to introduce sensory circuits too, what would you say would be your take home advice? Kind of, of course they could go access your book um, which is called Sensory Circuits, but if once they've got your book um, or whether they just want to start implementing it from Monday, what would you say in terms of just to go forward and how to implement them? I would say, um, activity is your friend okay mm -hmm. doing you know children are small brains developing and they are programmed to do therefore find activities that are physical that get them out of breath because that's okay. alerting and mm -hmm. um, that then equally you can do in the classroom that are calming. I've just thought of another one that is a good one in the classroom. Okay. Um, and I learned this from a Scandinavian teacher. They used to do um, handwriting every day with the child with their tummy down, lying over the chair with their book on the floor. So the child is lying down with a book on the floor and they were allowed to write like that, head down, pressure on them incredibly calming well that doesn't cost anything to do and of course the kids used to do masses of writing so they thought it was amazing uh -huh. um so adapting thinking i mean i don't mean to sell the book but you do need to sort of have an, a theory behind this and an understanding of what you're doing sure. um, so it's useful to have something like that but also, uh, you know, look is helpful, and uh, having con um, a chat with your local OT or posing any questions, brilliant. even in this group, and yeah. um, we yeah. could all help each other out. Yeah, 
yeah absolutely and have a go yeah I think that's excellent advice just have a go <laughs> yeah yeah because kids love doing and they'll love you for it and there's nothing better than being given permission to jump up and down 10 times before you do your maths yeah absolutely true Jane, I could talk to you for all <laughs> for all afternoon, all your evening, um, but I know we probably have to end the conversation at some point. Um, I want to say a massive thank you once again for giving up your time today. It's been really wonderful to kind of hear from yourself um, and how you envision sensory circuits taking place to be able to share with people across the world who are really interested to kind of try with their students just try something different and to ultimately help them in the classroom so thank you it's been my pleasure and I would love in the future, maybe if there's something else we can kind of touch base on to kind of do a follow up and um, it would be wonderful to kind of hear more thoughts um, in regard to kind of particularly sensory sensory motor ideas for the classroom because ultimately we just want to help our students and be able to attend learn and and focus Absolutely. and for everybody who's watching live yeah. i just want to say thank you for watching live too it's been really wonderful to have you pose your questions if you are watching replay please pop replay and pop where you're watching from because it would be great to know um, what's happening around the world and certainly coming into next week if you've been able to implement some of the sensory circuits concepts it would be wonderful to share them in the group because it would be great to hear how everyone is doing so i want to say a big thank you to everyone this afternoon this evening this morning wherever you're watching from and i look forward to seeing you again the next time 